Good evening and welcome to the Spirit and Life Bible Study. My name is Jonathan. Our reader is Kara tonight. And our topic is More Than Meets the Eye, Part 2, Mathematical Clues. Uh, we've been talking lately about Scripture and signs on the surface of Scripture that there's more there than meets the eye. And I've mentioned a few times in Bible study over the years about mathematical issues in Scripture, but I've had a, had a longing to do this. It may uh, bore everyone else, I don't know, but um, I want to give you a little glimpse, just in case it's appealing to you, that in the world of Bible math, I want to try to argue tonight that 5 divided by 3 equals 1, that 10 plus 1 equals 12, that 10 equals 16 equals 147, and that 12, of course, equals 14. So we will be looking at biblical evidence for what I've just uttered and pondering, were the people who wrote and edited the Bible mathematical morons? Or is this because there's more to the Bible than meets the eye? And you can guess where I land on that question. Shall we open with a prayer, good friends? <laughs> Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you're the one God of heaven and earth. We pray for your presence among us. We thank you for gathering us in your name. As we open the pages of your word, Lord, we seek you. We seek you even in the numbers even in the counting. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Amen. Great to be with you all, sending love out to those of you online and getting the audio and on the phone up in Canada. Great to be with you. And uh, I can't really explain or justify the fact that this is delightful to me, but it is, and I, I <coughs> hope I don't go completely overboard. Um, let's <laughs> Let's... I'm just going to pick three examples tonight, but let's go to the book of Revelation. Start at the right-hand end of your Bible, because why would I say that 5 divided by 3 equals 1 in the math of Scripture? Uh, let's go to Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Now, I'm planning to do another one of these sessions on kind of the laws of physics and time and space and so on, because Scripture has certain issues as well with things like time and space and the laws of physics. Uh, but to, I'm trying to focus just tonight on some of the mathematical issues. But the, um, uh, so we're going to read about stars and we're going to read about stars falling to earth. So set aside for a moment, dear friends, the issue of whether even one star could possibly fall on something that is infinitesimally much smaller than it, i.e. the earth. Try not to think about that, but let's just read what it says here in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. This is what John sees in his vision. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, <clears throat> there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Okay, so when I hear a phrase like the stars of heaven, I think it probably means all of the, the stars of heaven. It didn't say some of them or anything. So the stars of heaven, they all fell to the earth. Um, we had a lot of fun another time talking, talking about the fig tree and so on, but anyway, so there are stars falling to the earth. That's in chapter 6. Okay, in chapter 8, verse 12, what happens here? So there's two chapters later. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck. Oh, but I thought the sun already turned black. Okay, so a third of the sun was struck. A third of the moon. A third of the moon. And a third of the stars. A third of the now non-existent stars. So this is four-thirds of the stars have now been destroyed. Uh, go on, let's just read the rest of it. So that a third of them were darkened, 
a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Yes, and so that to me begs for a um, spiritual reading, uh, because if a third of the stars were destroyed, it wouldn't be that a third of the night would be dark. It would just mean all the night was two thirds as bright as it used to. Be. You see what I mean? You know, so it doesn't work that way. You know, if you struck a third of the sun and the moon, it's not that you lose a third of your day, you know, like eight hours of, or, you know, whatever, four hours of sunlight. So, okay, four thirds of the stars have been destroyed. Let's go to chapter 12, verse 4 the great dragon. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven okay. and threw them on the earth. Yes, it threw them on the earth. So this has already happened before, right? Like so all the stars were cast to the earth, then a third of them were darkened, then another third were thrown on the earth. This is why I say that five divided by three, five thirds equals one, like you have more thirds of the stars than there could possibly be. There's a little problem with the math. Okay, that's just one simple example. Let's take something much, much more crucial. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20 in the other end of the Bible, second book in Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments. Oh, actually, let's go first to Exodus 34. Sorry about that. Verse 28. This is about Moses going up on the mountain. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. Yes, that's right. The Ten Commandments. Ashereth uh, Hadvarim. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. But the Ten Commandments, it literally means Hadvarim. Dabar is... Um, is a Hebrew word that means word. This literally means the ten words. He wrote on the tables the ten words. The words of the covenant, the ten words. So the word word comes up twice in there. The ten, the ten words. But people, it just felt funny to the translator. And I must say, the, the Hebrew word dabar, word, means all kinds of things. It means things, it means, you know, it has a, just a hugely broad range of meanings. So you can see why somebody said, well, well, it couldn't mean words here because he wrote more than 10 words. So put in commandments, that's fine, you know, uh, the, the 10 commandments. But it literally says the 10 words. Turn to the right and go through Leviticus and Numbers to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 13. Same kind of context. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments. It's the same exact Hebrew wording, the Ten Words. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Right, the Ten. And you can see how you can say, oh, well, I mean, like in England when they say, may I have a word? That doesn't mean you only get one word, that, that means I have something I want to say to you. I mean, even in common parlance, we say things like that, that a, a word can stand for a whole bunch of words and so on. And in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 4, the same thing. This is when the Ten Commandments were kind of reissued after he broke them. And he wrote on the tablets, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments. Yes, and it literally says that the Ten Words but the word word means all kinds of different things. So, so 10 words. So, okay, 10 commandments. Now, let's go to Exodus chapter 20. And how does it open? It's just curious to me how it opens. How does it open, dear reader? What is 20 verse 1 right there? And God spoke all these words. Oh, these are words, okay, that he later says are the 10 words. Here are the words. Okay. And so we know that these are commandments, and a commandment is where someone tells you directly, you know, do this or don't do that sort of thing. Uh, so let's go through and just read the Ten Commandments okay. and try to count the number of commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Okay, now that is not a command. 
that's just a simple statement, right? I am the Lord your God. Who you brought you out of the land of Egypt is a subordinate clause. It's just a, you know, regular, that's not a command. It's just a statement of fact. Okay, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Ah, now that you shall have, that's a command. And uh, so you can tell it sort of feels different, doesn't it? You shall have, you know, it's telling you what not to do. You shall have no other gods before me. That's number one. That's command number one. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. Okay, that would be number two. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Okay. You shall not bow down to them, nor oh, serve them. Oh, that's the them. third one, isn't it? For I, the Lord... No, that, that's three and four. You shall not bow down to them, or... Nor, nor serve, serve them. them. Yes. Right? Those are two. Don't bow down, don't serve them. That's three and four, okay? For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Okay, no new commands in there. That's just a statement, okay? But showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, fine. You shall not uh, take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Okay, I think we're up to five. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Okay. Remember the Sabbath day to Six. keep it holy. Okay. Six days you shall labor and That's do seven. all your work. Eight. You see what I'm saying? Labor Six days and you do. will labor and do all your work is seven and eight. Okay. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Number nine. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother. There's number ten. That your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Okay, and then here we go. You shall not murder. Eleven. You shall not commit adultery. Twelve. You shall not steal. Thirteen. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Fourteen. You shall not covet. Fifteen. Your neighbor's house. You shall not covet. Sixteen. Your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. The sixteen commandments, ladies and gentlemen. I have said in other Bible studies that were 14, I was wrong. There are 16, of 10 equals 16. And this is 147 words in Hebrew, so it's 147 words, which are 16 commandments, which are the 10 words or 10 commandments. The, the math is interesting. And um, people get very attached, understandably, I agree with it, to the idea of 10. 10 is a powerful number. And so they will, you know, various different people have different theories about, well, do the two covets go together or is, the, or is this, could you split this one over? You know, because you got 16, so somehow you got to get the 16 into 10. So you figure out, okay, all those first ones are just one and, you know, roll them in together and then roll some of these other, and then you get it to work out to, to, six, to 10. But the fact that great groups of people can't agree on which are the 10 shows you that there's a, an issue there because it isn't 10, <laughs> you know, it's 16. But 10 is meaningful. That's what I'm talking about. It's, it's not literal, like it may not be mathematically accurate, but it's spiritually accurate to say that there's 10. 10 equals 16 equals 147. What's the 147? The number of actual Hebrew words. Oh, oh, oh. I know that God spoke all these words, and he says 147 words, and he says, so God wrote down the 10 words, you know, Okay. So, that's where the 147 comes in. Okay, how are we doing? <laughs> Having fun yet? So, uh, now we get to a fabulous thing. Uh, okay, let's just do 10 plus 1 equals 12, shall we? Okay, let's go now. Go to the right. Go through the five books of Moses, Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First Kings. I want to go to 1 Kings chapter 11, which is just really so magnificently wonderful. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, starting at verse 20, 
nine, shall we say? Okay. Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet, the prophet. Oh, hang on, wait a second. I, I wish it back up a little. No, oh, where did I have you? No, twenty-nine. You're you're in the right place. Good. Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, met him on the way, and he had clothed himself with a new garment. New garment. And the two were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. Very important. Brand new garment. Grabbed it, tore it into twelve pieces. Twelve pieces. Okay? And he said Remember to, that. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces. Take ten pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. I'll give ten tribes to you. So how many would be left? True. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David. Because in the Bible, 10 plus 1 equals 12. You had 12 pieces. You take 10 of them. I'll give the other one. Right? Go on. And for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Okay. Because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians. Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, mm. and Milcom, the god of the people of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways and do what is right in my eyes and keep my statutes and my judgments, as did his father David. However, I will not take the whole kingdom not out of the his whole hand, kingdom. because I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But... But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you. Ten, How many? Ten tribes. Give you ten tribes. And to his son I will give one tribe. One tribe. That my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. That's, that's the story. The taking of twelve pieces, give ten to one person, one to the other, and we're done. Because <laughs> ten plus one equals 12. In scriptural mathematics, it, you know, that's the story. And this comes up a lot. You've heard about the 10 lost tribes and all that stuff. You know, when, when, the, when the, 12, the tribes of Israel split apart, they split into 10 and, and 1. Uh, you know, it doesn't work mathematically, but that's how the text has it. Okay. So we've seen that 5 divided by 3 equals 1, that 10 equals 16 equals 147, that 10 plus 1 equals 12. But how could I possibly say that 12 equals 14? Well, this has to do with the children of Israel, the sons of Israel that become the tribes. And it's repeated again and again. I don't have passages for you, but that we'll probably see some in what we read. Uh, that they're just, It's constantly emphasized that there are 12. And when they're born, you do see that, they're, that they are 12. Uh, let's read this. Let's go back to Genesis to 29. We'll just sort of skim through here a little bit. But look at Genesis 29, verse 32, because here they come. And Scripture is very clear about their birth order. Okay, 29, verse 32. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. Reuben. Okay, that's good. And we, the explanation is fascinating, but we don't read it right now. And then look again in verse 33. She had another then son. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, et cetera, et cetera. He called his name Simeon. There's Simeon. Okay, and then in verse 34. She conceived again and bore a son. Levi at the end of the verse there. Levi. That's and right. 35. And 35. Judah. You get Judah. Okay, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Okay, and then in chapter 30, verse 6. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Dan is number 5. Okay, and then in verse 8. Uh, Naphtali, Rachel's maid, Bilhah, had Naphtali. Naphtali, that's right. And then in verse 11. Uh, Leah's made Zilpah, 
had Gad. Gad, that's right. And then in verse 13. Zilpah had Asher. Asher. And then in verse 18. Leah said, okay, she had her son named Issachar. Issachar, there you go. And then in verse 20. Leah gave birth to Zebulun. Zebulun, okay. And then and in verse 24. Dinah. Uh, the Lord shall add to me another son, Joseph. Joseph, there you go. That's right, there's Joseph. And then you have to turn all the way to 35, verse 18, to get the last of the 12, Benjamin. which is Benjamin in 35, verse 18. There's Benjamin. Okay, and then it's important to note that Joseph has two children in Genesis 41, Verse 51. 41, 51. So Joseph was one of those 12. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. That's right. And then in verse 52. And the second he called Ephraim. Ephraim. Okay. So Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Naphtali Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin, Manasseh, Ephraim. Now, the reason I mentioned those last two is that Scripture talks a lot about Manasseh and Ephraim, and in fact, um, okay, well, a couple of things I want to say about this. First of all, um, you may know people who have large families and so on. Uh, when there's a large family, anybody in the family can just rhyme off the names like a rocket. <laughs> you know, right? You memorize them in order, you just say, in the middle of a dead sleep, you could wake up, you just rhyme off the names. Always in order. Always, I, we, we have someone who's related to me in this room, who's one of 15 children. You just rhyme off those, those names like a shot, right? Um, and birth order's kind of a big deal, isn't it? Like, you know, if you're aware of your family and so on, you, you generally know where you came in, in, the, in the lineup. Which one are you? Where are you? So, and with all the oral tradition of Old Testament times, they must have had those names down like, they could just, you know, this, if this is what the Bible's teaching, it's a very important thing about these 12 sons of Israel who become these 12 tribes, getting the names right, getting them in the right order, you know, would seem like it was so easy. How could you even make a mistake? You just rip it off your tongue, you know? And yet, the second time they're ever mentioned is in Exodus chapter 1. Okay, and let's get the list starting in verse 2. Reuben, Simeon. That's number 1. Okay, in birth order, Simeon's number two, Levi's Levi, number three, Judah. Judas number four, Issachar. Issachar is actually number nine, Zebulun, Zebulun's number ten, Benjamin, Benjamin's number twelve, Dan, Dan is number five, Naphtali, Naphtali is number six, Gad, Gad is seven, and Asher, Asher is eight. The order is completely wrong. Second time you mention them, can't even get the names in the right order. I mean, they're all over the map, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 5, 6, 12, 7. You know, what, what's going on there? You know? It's, it's amazing. Okay, look at Numbers chapter 1. So this is, you know, these are the five books of Moses. This is what it's all about. Uh, so turn to the right through Leviticus. So we'll get to Numbers and look at chapter 1. In verse 5, it goes through all the tribes. Every tribe. Okay, we're going to go through the tribes. These right. are the names of the men who shall stand with you. From Reuben. Okay, so it mentions Reuben. Then in six is Simeon. Simeon, okay, that's number one and number two. Seven is Judah. Oh, Judah is number four. Verse eight mentions Issachar. Okay, Issachar's number nine. Verse nine mentions Zebulun. Zebulun's number ten. Ten mentions Joseph. Of the children of Joseph, but then it also mentions both of his sons, Ephraim, Ephraim. and Manasseh. Mm -hmm. And then you get Benjamin, Benjamin, who's the, actually the youngest. Then Dan. Then Dan, who's number five. I mean, if I'm placed younger than the youngest, I've, I'm sort of upset about, you know, what's he doing listed after that, okay? 
Asher. Okay, Asher's number eight. Gad. Gad is number seven. Naphtali. And Naphtali is number six. So we start going in reverse order. And again, this is like what I was talking about the other week. You know, when you hear scripture, you just read, yeah, 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 those, those are 12 tribes of Israel. And you don't really have your analytical mind engaged. So you just sort of, yeah, that's I'm sure that's approximately right. You know, <laughs> you don't realize. Uh, I, I called someone uh, today about this who has studied this quite a bit. And he said that there are 19 lists in scripture of the 12 children of Israel. Now, sometimes you'll get a list and then it's immediately unpacked or something, and that'll be in the same order. But in the 19 lists, there are no repetitions. The same order is never given twice. Now, if you know a large family, you can tear off the names. What is going on? What is going on? And another very interesting thing to me, like in that whole list that we just read, Levi's just like chopped liver. He's, he didn't even make the list, right? Just gone. In fact, Levi's left off a lot of the lists. The other one who's left off a lot of the lists is uh, Joseph. Joseph gets left off all the time, and, and Manasseh and Ephraim get in there, into the list. Um, okay, uh, let's look at Deuteronomy 27. Um, all right, so turn to the right. There, there's a bunch in numbers, but it, it, I'm telling you, every time, it's like 1, 2, 4, 10, 12, 3, 11, 5, 6, 9, 8, 7. Oh, no, next time it's 4, 5, 1, 10, 12, 6, 11, 2, 3, 9, 8, 7. Oh, no, the next time it's 1, 2, 4, 9, 11, 12, 10, 7, you know. Actually, to give a list of 12 people 19 times and never repeat is kind of a feat. You know, that's, that's kind of amazing to never do it the same way twice. And there's always 12 names, or almost always 12 names, and they're always drawn from the same group of 14, but two are always left out, and it's a different two. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And these are the tribes. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Okay, look at Deuteronomy 27. It's just kind of fun. Uh, oh, let's see. Um, what do I want here? What, what are my verses here? Deuteronomy 27. Okay, let's start at verse 11. And Moses commanded the people on the same day, saying, These shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you have crossed over the Jordan. Okay. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. Oh, okay, so you're saying numbers two, three, four, nine, eleven, and twelve will be on one mountain and they're blessing. Okay. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal to curse. Curse. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. I.e. number one, seven, eight, ten, five, and six, uh, which is a different order than you ever see them anywhere else. And so now they're divided in two, and one set's going to bless, another set's going to curse. I mean, uh, either the editing is really bad, or there's more than meets the eye. That's what I'm trying to drive at here, good friends. Okay, next one I want to look at is Joshua. I don't know. Okay, so right after Deuteronomy, you have the book of Joshua. Oh, let's see. I think we should go to Joshua chapter 15. Oh, so many great names in there. Oh, yeah, it's just an amazing. If I had to read all of this, dear reader, yes, that's right. Very fun. Um, but we're just going to skim through this. So now they're getting into the land and all the different allotments are being assigned to these supposedly 12, which are really 14 tribes of, of Israel. Okay. So in 15 verse 1, who is the first group that's mentioned? So this was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah, okay. according to now, their families. Judah's number four in the birth order, but somehow he's number one in this list. 
And it gives you a whole lot of names and place names. I would love to challenge our dear reader with all that. But we'll <laughs> skip over all of that. I know, it's disappointing. OK, now chapter 16. OK, so now Judah's all set. And a lot of stuff about Judah. OK, 16, verse 1. The lot fell to the children of Joseph from the Jordan by Jericho. Joseph. Et cetera, et cetera. OK, Joseph was number 11. So we had number 4. We have number 11. And then down below there, look at verse 4. So the children of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, took their inheritance. Okay, those are the children of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. Okay, good. And look down in verse 9, it says this weird thing. The separate cities for the children of Ephraim were among the inheritance of the children of Manasseh. Now the whole point of what you're saying is that they got their different inheritances and yet somehow, so you got Joseph, you got Ephraim, Manasseh, and yet all the cities of Ephraim happen to be in Manasseh. Oh, okay, uh, fine. I, I thought we were divvying it up, but I guess we're not. Okay, and then in number 17, we have the third tribe that we're going to look at. Okay, drum roll, verse 1. There was also a lot for the tribe of Manasseh. For... Wait, 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 wait. Go back to 16, verse 4. So the children of Joseph... Manasseh and Ephraim took their inheritance. So you're trying to tell me that we had Judah in chapter 15. We had Joseph in chapter 16, which included Ephraim and Manasseh, and the cities of Ephraim were in Manasseh. And then in chapter 17, we have the tribe of Manasseh. It's a little problem with the math or something. You know, how, how did we get... Okay, we got Manasseh in there. Okay, so those are three. Okay, and look at 18, verse 2. But there remain... Remember, we've had three, but they weren't really three because one sort of had two of them under it, sort of. So I don't know what... It, would you say Judah, Joseph, Ephraim, Manasseh, plus Manasseh? I don't know how many that is. Is that four? Is that five? Is that two and a half? I, I, I don't know how many that is. <laughs> but however many that is... It's roughly three-ish or something. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, look at 18, verse 2. But there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes. Seven tribes. Okay, so there's seven, so three from 12 or 14 naturally equals seven. Yes. Okay, and how are the seven going to go? Okay, look at verse 5. They shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall remain in their territory. We already south, had Judah. And the house of Joseph shall remain in the Joseph, north. Joseph, okay. But the Levites have no part among you. Oh, where are you? You skipped number six. I verse did. six, I think. Okay. You shall therefore survey the land in seven parts. Okay. And bring the survey here to me. That but the I Levites make, have no part. But the Levites have no part. Okay, seven plus three. Plus, plus, okay, that's one. That's 11. Okay. And Gad, Reuben, and half the tribe of Manasseh. What is Manasseh? Is it Hoggy or something? He's, he's, this is the third time he's been in here. Now this time it's only a half tribe. But half tribe of Manasseh. We, we had Manasseh in chapter 16. And then he got his own chapter in chapter 17. And now he's also... I, I don't get it. Okay, so Gad, Reuben, half tribe of Manasseh. The Levites, all right. So we got seven left. And who are the seven... So... It goes verse 11. Now the lot of the tribe of the children of Benjamin There's came Benjamin, up. There's Benjamin, 19 verse 1. The second lot came out for Simeon. Oh, that came out for Simeon. So Benjamin is number 12. Simeon is son number 2. Verse 10. The third lot came out for the children of Zebulun. Zebulun is really number 10. And then the fourth came out for Issachar. In verse 17, who is number 9. And then in verse 24, it's Asher, who is actually number 8. And then in verse 32, Naphtali, who is number 6. And then in verse 40, Dan, who is number 5. And those are your 7. So 2.5 or 3 or 4 or 5 plus 7 equals approximately 12 or 14, <laughs> right? Uh, this is the math of scripture. Um, and, okay, um, <laughs> I, I just think it's, it's just, just amazing to me somehow. You know, and when you're reading it, you sort of, yep, okay, sounds good. Swedenborg adds to this a little bit. 
Okay, the first five sons go Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan. Judah's number four, Dan is number five. Swedenborg says, with a straight face, and I think he's absolutely right, he says, really, Judah's the firstborn and Dan is the last. Number four is the firstborn and number five is the last. It's just amazing, you know? He's further piling on. I mean, there's room for us all to get in there and have some fun with this. Uh, it, it's so amazing. And what Swedenborg says, and, and he won't even go into detail. He, unfortunately, a lot of the time, when he's describing the birth order, he does go into some detail. But he says that when they come up in all these, these 19 different ways that the list is given, he said, all he says is that these Names have meanings, but the meanings change when the order changes. So Gad down here means something different than Gad up here. Okay, that's fun. <laughs> and the whole thing depends. There, there's, only, um, there's only three people I can find who ever start the list. The li it's, it's not just totally random. The lists, as far as I know, all start with either Reuben or Judah or occasionally, as we saw there, Simeon. But one of the first four always sort of heads it up. And depending on who it is. Now, I know nothing about any of this, but I can glimpse the fact that Reuben has to do with truth and he has to do with faith. So when you start with Reuben, then it's talking about truth starting. And truth starting, didn't we talk last time, good friends, about the creation story, that there are two creation stories? The seven days of creation, male and female created, and then you have a different creation story. Well, going from Reuben is going from truth and working your way up. Whereas going from Judah is starting with love and, and working your way down. So it's a very different family when J Judah starts it out. And that changes who's first, who's mentioned first in the list, goes chick, 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 chick down the list and makes the meaning of everybody else's name change. Uh, what this also made me think of is the fact that um, we talked a few weeks ago about what's called the Urim and the Thummim, or the, the breastplate that the high priest would wear, had 12 stones on it for the 12 tribes of Israel, and it wrote the names on it. I don't know which of the 14 names they wrote on there, but they, they wrote them on and they would light up and they would light up and the high priest would hear a voice. And this is how they'd be communicated with by God. Well, I don't know if I'm getting it across at all, good friends, but when you get 19 lists and they're all different, isn't it like the lights lighting up in a different order? You know, aren't we seeing the Urim and the Thummim, like the blink. We can't tell what they mean, but they're, but they're blinking and they're in a different sequence. It's so amazing. In an oral tradition, in a culture that cares terrifically about who's born first, there's no earthly reason for there to be 19 different lists of the family. And 19 different lists, each of which has approximately 12 people on it, out of the 14 possible names, but you save them and trade them and mix them and swap them and, you know, and, and you, there's our list, there's our 12. And then, oh, here's another list. Okay, now, go to the Revelation at the, all the way to the right in your volume again, where we started out this evening. And look at chapter seven, and we'll start at verse four, famous passage. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel all were, the tribes. were sealed. Namely? <clears throat> the tribe of Judah. Ah, it starts with Judah. He was number four. But that means we're talking about love here. The tribe of Reuben. Reuben has to do with faith or truth. The tribe of Gad. When he comes second like that. Okay, and then Gad is number seven in the original birth order. 
Uh, the tribe of Asher. Asher was originally number eight. The tribe of Naphtali. Naphtali was number six. The tribe of Manasseh. And Manasseh was number 13. I mean, he's not even part of the original 12, okay? The tribe of Simeon. He was number two. The tribe of Levi. Number three. The tribe of Issachar. Issachar was number nine. The tribe of Zebulun. He was number 10. The tribe of Joseph. Joseph was number 11. And the tribe of Benjamin. And Benjamin's number 12. Now, it's really amazing. Dan is not in there. And Ephraim's not in there. Now, Dan was one of the original 12. Doesn't even make the list. And Ephraim was Manasseh's brother. And Ephraim and Manasseh were sons of Joseph. And Joseph is in the list. And Manasseh's in the list. And Ephraim isn't. It's still happening in Revelation. They're still hacking the list. You know, it's amazing. All through Scripture, this thing is still going, you know, it's still doing all that and having a different meaning every time. So I think this is a really, really deep mystery. Now, it, um, I, I know that I'm weird for thinking this is fun. I do accept that, good friends. Uh, but in my own defense, I would say, according to what Swedenborg says about angels, angels, I'm not accusing myself of being an angel, but angels are really, really interested in this. Like people on earth, it's very hard to get interested in whether Naphtali came before Dan or after. But to in the heavens, these names are so meaningful. And, oh, yes, it's this group, and that was not in there now. You know, they, I, I mean, when you realize it's 14, you see numbers... I, I feel I have to say a shocking thing, good friends, that occurred to me today. Um, it's sort of like you see a spill on the ground and you say, oh, well, we've got that wedding dress hanging up in the closet. We could use that, <laughs> you know. Um, we use numbers so much in our culture. Our culture is number nuts. I mean... You know, we count everything. Censuses of our population, the, the money, stock market, everything. You know, I've told you before, I have a daily planner that counts how many, day, you know, what is the number of this day today? And how many more days are there in the year? And all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, we're, we're crazy about numbers and, and we just go nuts. And we have computers and we can do graphs and all that kind of stuff. That's great. And that's very, very useful. But it struck me today that when you really start to realize what a number is, that's like using a wedding garment to clean up a spill. There is so much more to what a number is. A number is so much more powerful than that. Yes, there were 14 people, but the 12, you see, the 12 is bigger you know, when we get stuck in this sort of, well, wait, there were 14. It's wrong. It should be fixed. We're still, we're still counting. We're still wiping the floor with the wedding dress. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not understanding that 12 is something huge. You know, it's, it's a massive, beautiful thing. Ten were, the Ten Commandments, that, that is ten. I don't care if it's 16 imperative verbs or 147 words. That is 10 of something. And the 10 of it is truer than the 16. It's truer than the 147. You know what I mean? And, and the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles, I don't have a whole riff to give you about that, but I know that there's a Nathaniel who shows up in John who isn't in the other gospels. There's a Levi, but there's also a Matthew. And there's, you know, again, you got like 14, 15 names. Were there 12 apostles or were there 12, you know? Because tw it doesn't matter if there's 14 or 15. They're the 12 because of what 12 is. And if we could understand what numbers are and what they're doing, uh, we, we might start to love this as much as the angels do. The reason that 10 plus 1 would be 12, it, it, it makes perfect emotional sense, doesn't it? You take 12 and you split it and then you got the 10 and you got the one. You're not going to end up with two over here. 
I, I don't know how to put it into words. I'm, I'm babbling, but uh, no different than any other week, is it, good friend? The, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that, that babbling are us. Um, the, it, it makes emotional sense somehow because 11 is a, has a different meaning. What 11 is doesn't enter into that or what 14 is. You know, it doesn't enter into it. I haven't even begun to say anything tonight about the Trinity or three being one or how often in Scripture two things are one. But we could do thousands of hours on that. There's so many paired things. We looked at that a little bit textually last week, how pairs of things mean the same thing and so on. Two equals one and three equals one all, all the time. But even the, the, the seven days of creation are very much like a three, like the first three are like a one and the second three are like a one. And then that seventh one is like another one. So the seven equals three. Um, and I would argue that from the fact that in the first three days of creation, nothing is animate. There are no birds, there are no animals, there are no humans. It's plants growing up and so on. But not, nothing is running around, you know, in the first three. And the, and the, and if you layer the, the second three on top of the first three, you can see there are themes uh, kind of thing. You know, like when the water's above and the water's below, and then you get the birds and the fish, you know, that's what lives in the water's above and the water's below. So you can layer them on top of each other, and then the, the seven turns into three. So the three is also very much of a seven in Scripture. Uh, it's also related to the three and a half. My friend reminded me tonight that the reason Swedenborg says that... Uh, the number 40, as you may know, it happens a lot in Scripture, and it means spiritual crisis. It means going through a trial or a very difficult time. And Swedenborg says the reason it means that is because it's 6 times 7. 6 times 7 is not 40, but we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. You know? He's one foot in the spiritual world. He's allowed to do that with math. You know, <laughs> The more spiritual you get, the more it works that way. Um, uh, I, there's something I love about the idea that these lists are so deep in meaning that like these lists of these names, even the genealogies and that sort of stuff in Scripture, in the heavens, they are seeing light through this that we is totally opaque to us. And I have to admit, even Swedenborg seems to struggle a little bit with all he can say is it changes and it depends on who starts and when it starts this it means that but but he, he can't always unpack the whole you know all 19 different lists and tell you what's going on and all he, he may know and may not have time to write it or may not be allowed to write it or something I don't know or it may just be you know just one of those deep mysteries but what I'm driving at tonight is that the math in scripture does not always align with earthly math because it's serving a higher purpose. Same as the physics in the days of creation and so on. It's serving a higher purpose. It's expressing spiritual things that transcend time and space. So I can picture us going to the other world and saying, well, I counted it up. And it's, but how is 10 plus one? I don't get how that equals 12. And they say, are you still counting? Really, that's counting? You, you want to count them? Uh, we're deep into what 10 is, what 1 is, what 12 is. Like, like the, the counting, that, that's of time and space. We're, that's not what we're talking about here, here in Scripture. It's something deeper than that. Um, that's why you can have a third of the stars fall down again and again and, and get dark. So I love this example. Our title is More Than Meets the Eye, Mathematical Clues. And to me, when you look at the math, and we've hardly, you know, there, there's a lot of numbers in, in Scripture, and, and they're fascinating what the numbers are doing, and sometimes you, you can't line it up and so on. Um, either, to me, you've got sort of three choices, like either the people who originally wrote the Bible really could hardly count to 15, you know, struggled with the concept of 12 or something. I don't think so. They kept track of sheep and goats and all kinds. Of, you know, I, I think they knew how to count. 
Uh, but that was one argument you could put forward. Okay, they just weren't that great at counting. Um, or, number two, they were okay at counting and then later editors come in and, and the editors somehow ruin the math or, or you know, it's, it's not the author's fault, it's the editor's fault. They, they didn't know what they were doing or something. But you would think if later editors had come in, they would fix that stuff. A whole passage about take 12 pieces, you take 10, I'll take one, you know? Like you ought to fix that, you know? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not right, it doesn't work. Um, but scripture is the way that it is uh, for a reason. Uh, and the third option is that there's more than meets the eye. What one means is so important. What Judah means is so important. That's why, in effect, he's a firstborn. You start with Reuben, but you really work your way up to Judah. Swedenborg talks all the time, doesn't he? Those of you who read him uh, know that he talks about the fact that truth, like learning, that sort of thing, marching orders, may be the first thing in time it's the first thing in, in, that you encounter and by acting on the truth then that leads you to good reuben gets you to judah through via simeon and levi but actually the love was always the first thing so it's first in end in the language of the old translation it's primary that's why reuben sometimes starts the list sometimes judah starts the list and one is acknowledgement of an appearance, another is an acknowledgement of a reality that love is the most important thing. Oh, uh, and there are many passages about how Dan is the furthest extreme of the land from Dan to Beersheba. He is like the outmost thing. So it's like something that climbs up to love and then goes bang down to the outmost and then starts to build these metal things and so on. It's, it's got shapes in there in what's going on. So either the people of the Bible, if, if you could say that five-thirds in some sense equals 100% of the stars, or if 10 is the same as 16, which equals 147, or 10 plus 1 equals 12, or 12 equals 14, or at least 14 go to make up 12, but a different 12 every time you turn around, either there's bad math in Scripture or there's more in Scripture than meets the eye. And I'm very drawn to that second explanation because it is so satisfying to me to iron out all that stuff and to whet our appetite. You know, uh, let me ask you, friends. If someone said um, there weren't 12, you know, sons of Israel, there, there were really 11. You go, oh, I mean, where, where's that piece of information get you? What happens? Your life change? Does anything happen? Nothing happens. Doesn't matter. 12, 18, doesn't matter. Totally irrelevant. Right? That number means nothing. But if someone says, if you start from truth, this is where you get. And the gad that means a troop comes or the asher that means delight fits in this way into the series. Whereas if you start from love and then Reuben, didn't it say that one time Judah? And then Reuben was just next. That's love, and then faith is right behind it. It's right there, and then you build your list, and Naphtali has to do with struggling and temptation. And all that. You build your list down from there. Uh, that has to do with who we are, how we become angels while we're here on earth. It has to do with the transformation, the possibilities in the human soul. It's so rich that in comparison with that, just mere counting, is such a small and, and meaningless thing. It's sort of, it's where we start, and that's fine. It is kind of Reuben-ish to count. It's Judah-ish to see that the whole thing is about love. How about that? I turned them into adjectives. That was good. <laughs> I like that. The, uh, <laughs> and, and Scripture is begging us to be Judah-ish. Go ahead and start out at Reuben if you want. But please, go through Simeon, which is obedience. Levi has to do with, with uh, love and charity, you know, serving the neighbor and all that stuff. And you get to Judah, which means a heavenly kind of love. Go, go on that journey towards love. And these lists, these names, even the numbers will start to make more sense to us. That's what the Lord laid on my heart. Shall we close with a prayer, good friends?
our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You are the God of all things. You are that aboriginal sound. You say in Swedenborg's True Christianity, the sound itself cannot be created. You are the voice of God radiating out through the universe, a vibration, an energy in numbers, endless, amazing numbers. We thank you, Lord, for a glimpse of who you are, just an outer shell of who you are, and seeing something about how even the counting in Scripture has been, been, been taken into your service, has been driven to serve you. It's not about the math. It's all about love and truth. We thank you, Lord. Our Father who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's keep on repenting till those numbers make sense.